Well, greetings to you. My name is Anelia Wright Mosley, and I just wanted to pause on today to give honor to the amazing African American men, women, boys, and girls who lost their life on this day in 1921. Yes, right in one of the most wealthiest African American communities in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Yes, that was the old black true Wall Street. And because of racism, and I'm going to allow the story to be told through a video I'm going to show. I encourage you to watch this video. In the spring of 1921, the black community of Tulsa, Oklahoma, enjoyed significant economic prosperity and political independence. Located in the city's Greenwood District and known as Negro Wall Street, it was considered one of the wealthiest black communities in the nation. On May 30th, 1921, a 19-year-old black man boarded an elevator in a downtown building. The elevator operator was a 17-year-old white girl. A store clerk heard a scream, ran to the elevator to find the girl, then called police because he thought she had been attacked. The girl told police she had just been startled by the man and did not want to press charges. However, rumors spread and the story quickly morphed into a rape allegation. Police then arrested the black man and jailed him at the courthouse. The next night, a mob of white men sought to lynch him, but the sheriff and deputies defended the jail, along with 30 armed black men from Greenwood who also stood guard. In the hours that followed, white rioters attacked the town, burning 40 city blocks, killing almost 300 black residents and displacing thousands of others. The prosperous black community was destroyed, but none of the rioters was convicted and survivors didn't receive a penny of compensation for lost property. If we were to go back in time to 1920 and walk up and down Greenwood Avenue, one thing that would probably strike us is the absolute variety of businesses. The numbers are astonishing. 30 restaurants, 45 groceries and meat markets. There were dry goods stores, milliners, a photography studio, dental offices. Greenwood is no longer called Greenwood. It's now known as Black Wall Street. This whole idea of self-containment really existed there. The dollar would stay in that community sometimes over three, five years before it ever went outside of the community. In 1919, black soldiers returned from World War I with high expectations for racial progress at home. But in one city after another, white mobs erupted in violence, targeting black veterans, citizens, and businesses. Hundreds died. On Tulsa's Black Wall Street, African Americans, including armed veterans, watched nervously and prepared for what might come. Countering this white militancy is very much an African American spirit of, we're gonna defend ourselves. If the mob comes, we're not gonna run, we've got our guns and we're gonna protect ourselves. And that was especially important and valuable and potent in Greenwood. On May 30th, 1921, the mob came to Greenwood. This white woman is in an elevator and this black teenager allegedly whistles at her or talks to her. He is taken to jail. A mob gathers of whites and blacks, and blacks in Tulsa are armed. They take their Second Amendment rights seriously, and they come with guns. And this is a threat. Someone fires into the crowd, and the riot is born. This was not about the whistling boy in the elevator. This was about blacks becoming too economically powerful and showing that wealth in a way that anyone would by creating buildings and constructing churches and having property. There was a, a whistle that blew, and then the mass invasion and the destruction of Greenwood began. 
When the smoke cleared in the early morning of June 1st, 1921, Black Wall Street lay in ruins. This is by far the largest single incident of racial violence in all of American history. It's a repulsive, violent act that is still affecting lives today. Having not received any type of reparations, um, just now being at a point where we are truly acknowledging this history, there's a lot of uh, historical trauma that they are experiencing. Doctor teaches African and African American studies at the University of Oklahoma. What have been one of the wealthiest communities, most educated communities, most peaceful communities um, in the country um, was destroyed uh, in less than 18 hours. The hatred overflowed on May 31, 1921, after a young black man named Dick Rowland entered the Drexel building in downtown Tulsa and stepped aboard an elevator being operated by a white woman named Sarah Page. Dick Rowland walks into the elevator, Sarah Page is there, uh, the elevator door closes, there's a scream, the door opens again and she runs out. Within hours, Roland had been accused of assault, even rape. He's arrested and placed in the city's jail. <laughs> newspapers in town begin to run their version of the story. The newspapers in Tulsa begin to report an assault and even a rape. As the story spread through the white neighborhoods, so did the anger. And there's talk of a lynching, that Vic Rowland's going to be taken from the jail and lynched that night. When we realize um, and acknowledge the history, we understand some of what they are experiencing emotionally and mentally and even spiritually. Uh, innocent people, bystanders. African Americans caught in the violent racist attack were killed. Their livelihoods wiped from the map. Their community was destroyed, their homes were destroyed, their businesses were destroyed, their churches were destroyed, their schools were destroyed. Since then, Tulsa has been left with a scar that is yet to heal. Wounds that have caused distrust of city leaders and allowed for systemic racist policies to dictate the lives of African Americans why buildings are burning is because this city, this state, would prefer preserving that white nationalism and that white supremacist mindset over arresting, charging, and helping to convict mm -hmm, mm -hmm. four officers who killed the black man. Mm -hmm. That is the reality of what we're dealing with. Mm -hmm. This is not just a few cops doing things yeah. across the country. Mm -hmm. This is a coordinated activity happening right. across this nation. Mm -hmm. And so we are in a state of emergency. Mm -hmm. Black people are dying in a state of emergency. The reason why buildings are burning are not just for our brother George Floyd. People here in Minnesota are saying to people in New York, to people in California, to people in Memphis, to people all across this nation, enough is enough. Yeah. And we are not responsible for the mental illness that has been inflicted upon our people by the American government, institutions, and those people who are in positions of power. So if you are not coming to the people's defense, right. then don't challenge us when young people and other people People who are frustrated and instigated by the people you pay. You are paying instigators to be among our people out there throwing rocks, breaking windows, and burning down buildings. And so young people are responding to that. They are enraged, and there's an easy way to stop it. Arrest the cops. Charge the cops. Charge all the cops. Not just some of them, not just here in Minneapolis. Charge them in every city across America where our people are being murdered. Charge them everywhere. That's the bottom line. Charge the cops. Do your job. Do what you say this country is supposed to be about, the land of the free for all. It has not been free for black people, and we are tired. Don't talk to us about looting. Y'all are the looters. America has looted black people. America looted the Native Americans when they first came here. So looting is what you do. We learned it from you. We learned violence from you. We learn violence from you. The violence was what we learned from you. So if you want us to do better, then damn it, you do better.